So this is the building a real-time recommendation engine with Neo4j workshop. Um, if you're in the wrong run, you still have a few minutes to go somewhere else. Uh, these slides are online down at the bottom. If you can't read it, that says bit.ly slash Neo4j OSCON slides, all one word. Uh, and it also has all of the, the other links we'll be, using, uh, we'll be using today. If you didn't get a chance to install Neo4j, uh, that's fine. We're going to use the Neo4j sandbox uh, today, so you won't need, to, won't need to worry about installing Neo4j. Um, we are going to do a, session, a section in uh, Python. So if you have Jupyter installed, uh, in the slides here, there's a link to a Jupyter notebook. Um, and we'll, we'll use that, but that won't be, uh, that won't be until after, well after the break. So for now, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So my name's Will. I work on the developer relations team at Neo4j. Uh, I work on things like building integrations with Neo4j, um, and then also making sure that our users are successful with Neo4j. Uh, right now, I'm working on a GraphQL integration for Neo4j. Any, any GraphQL users in the room? No? OK. Um, so my, my contact details are here. Feel free to, to reach out after the workshop or you know, during OSCON. Happy to, happy to chat with anyone. I'll, I'll be here all week. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, so the rough schedule is for the next 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of Neo4j and recommender systems. Uh, and then we're going to dive right into actually using Neo4j. Um, we're going to learn about graph data modeling, data import. We're going to learn Cypher, which is the query language for Neo4j. Uh, so the, the goal is for most of the session to be hands-on with you working with Neo4j, writing Cypher queries. Uh, we have a data set that we're going to work through to see how we can import, model that, and query it. Just curious, how many people have used Neo4j before? OK, so maybe a, a third or so. And uh, how many people have used another graph database other than Neo4j? OK, cool. Uh, so this is the rough outline. The, the break is at 3, 3 to 3.30, I think. If that's wrong, someone uh, let me know, please. Great, thank you. OK, so for those of you not familiar with Neo4j, um, Neo4j is a graph database. That means that we model, store, and query our data as a graph. Specifically, the data model that we use is the property graph data model. Um, we use the Cypher query language, uh, which is part of the Open Cypher project. So it's an open query language. Uh, there are other database projects that implement um, Open Cypher as well. Um, and then there's this concept of native graph processing that's really important uh, for graph databases. So what this means is that when we traverse a graph, so traversing a graph is the primary way that we, we interact with it when we write a query. We go from, from one node to another that's connected to by following a relationship. This is traversing. And this concept of native graph processing uh, means that we don't have to look up an index when we do this traversal. So essentially, when we do a traversal, we're just chasing pointers. Uh, that means that the performance characteristic of a local graph traversal is then the same for a graph with 1,000 nodes versus one with a million nodes. So this is a really, really important concept when it comes to performance. Um, and this is something that, that is very important for graph databases. So Neo4j also has lots of uh, clients or language drivers and, and lots of different languages. Uh, later today, we're going to be using the Python driver for Neo4j. Uh, and then finally, I just want to point out that Neo4j is open source. Right? All the code is on GitHub. We can build it from source. We can download it uh, and get started. 
Cool. So that's a brief overview um, of Neo4j and, and sort of graph databases in general. Let's dig in to the, the graph data model, and specifically the labeled property graph model. So these are the basic components of the property graph model. So nodes, these are the entities uh, or, or the objects. We can store uh, arbitrary key value pair properties on nodes. And then nodes have one or more labels. Um, in, in this example, the label is node, which is not, not very helpful. Um, but the, you, you can think of the label as the type or the, the class uh, of, the, of the entity. Then we, tr we treat relationships as first class citizens in, uh, in, in the property graph model. So relationships are, are modeled explicitly, connecting two nodes. Relationships have a single type, a direction, and again, arbitrary key value pair properties. So if we were to map this to sort of language semantics, we would say that uh, nodes are nouns, key value pair properties are the adjectives that describe the nouns, we can think of relationships as verbs that connect nouns, and adverbs are the properties on relationships that describe the verb. So just another way to think of our data model. So what kind of data can we model as a graph? Uh, well, here are some examples. Uh, so we could model information about businesses and users that have reviewed the business. Um, businesses are in a certain category. And we also have a, a social component here, so users are friends with other users. We could also model information about credit cards and credit card transactions that occurred at some merchant that's in a zip code where we have some risk score associated with the card. Uh, and, and this type of data model might be useful uh, if we're interested in detecting fraud. Uh, we could also model information about companies and, and VC funding, uh, their business models, um, what investors participated in various funding rounds. Uh, and this might be useful if we're, we're trying to, for example, see in a given city if, if there are clusters of companies in a certain industry and the VCs that are funding them. Maybe we want to know what are the right VCs to pitch uh, given the startup that we're thinking about launching. Um, this is actually the, the data model, or say the data set, that we're going to use today. Uh, so how many people are members of meetup.com? Quite a few, cool. So, so if you're not familiar, um, we're gonna talk a lot more about uh, meetup uh, once we start working with data. But the basic idea is uh, you're a member of one or more groups, Groups host events, <coughs> members attend events where you, you meet each other, you learn about um, cool topics, and these events occur at some venue. Um, and so what we're gonna focus on today are how we can, can first of all import data uh, using this data model, and then how we can uh, query this data set to maybe recommend groups that you might be interested uh, in joining or events that you might be interested in attending uh, based on topics that we've inferred that you're interested in and, and maybe uh, some social graph that we've also extracted. Um, all that information can, can play a role in the type of recommendations that, uh, that we want to work with. Uh, and, and then another really common use case uh, that we see people using graph databases for are um, in, in the general category of IT and network operations. So you can think of all of the components in, in a data center uh, from racks to switches to routers to the actual, um, the actual hardware, the virtual machines, 
Um, this is all sort of a big dependency graph. And uh, modeling that data as a graph, storing it in a graph database, makes it very useful for doing things like root cause analysis, dependency analysis. If this service goes down, uh, is there a single point of failure? What, what applications will be impacted if uh, one of my nodes in a database cluster goes down? These kinds of things. Um, and, and you can see that there is a link um, for all of these, these data models. Um, and, and so these come from real examples that you, can, uh, that you can play around with. So if you get the slides, you know, feel free to, to dig into a, a use case there that you might find interesting. So really, we think that you know, graphs are, are everywhere. Uh, once you start sort of thinking in terms of how you can model data as a graph, you start to see graph problems different places that you look. Um, and, and this is really something that you know, hopefully we can, can get across today. Cool, so that's the, the basic idea of the labeled property graph model. Uh, so now we need to talk about uh, how we query a graph model. Uh, with Neo4j, we use a query language called Cypher, which I said is, is part of the Open Cypher project. Uh, Cypher is a query language for graphs. You can think of it as, as SQL for graphs, but designed for graphs. So what does it look like? Um, we're just going to look at an example uh, because we're going to be spending a lot of time uh, later on, like learning Cypher and, and actually writing uh, some Cypher queries. But here's an example. So on the first line here, we're saying match. So this is kind of like a select. Uh, and then we give the match statement some graph pattern. And we can, th these patterns are defined in this kind of ASCII art. Um, ASCII art sort of diagram. So nodes are defined within parentheses, uh, and labels follow a colon. Labels and, and relationship types follow a colon. So in this case, we're saying find nodes with the label movie, uh, bind that to the alias or variable m, so we can refer to it later. Uh, now follow incoming rated relationships to find the user that reviewed these movies. And then I have a where clause, so now I want to filter uh, where the title property of that movie contains matrix. And then I want to do a group by the title, do an aggregation for the number of reviews, and return the movie and the number of reviews ordered by the number of reviews. So essentially this query says, Find me all of the Matrix movies, find all of the users who rated those Matrix movies, and tell me uh, what Matrix movies have the most reviews. Um, so this is just sort of what we just talked through, uh, breaking down the different operations uh, in the query. So that was just an example. Um, there, there's lots of more content for digging into Cypher on, uh, on the web. Neo4j.com slash developer is a good resource, maybe. Um, has lots of, lots of code samples uh, and different, uh, different use case examples using Cypher. So that's, that's a good place to start. Uh, so let's talk now about uh, recommendations, since that's the focus uh, for sort of the, the use case that we want to dig into. Um, by the way, does, it, does anyone have any questions? And, and feel free as, as we go throughout today to, to sort of raise your hand or shout out if you have questions. I want to make sure this is sort of as, as interactive as, as we can make it with a, with a big group here. But any questions of things we covered at this point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a kind of rule of thumb just which way, you know, I noticed in some of your examples you might say like a city has this industry, but you could also say like the industry is in the city, and I'm just curious if how you figure out which way the arrow goes in certain situations. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the question is uh, related to the direction of relationships, and sort of is there is there a standard for which way the, the direction goes, uh, right? We, here we have company has office in city, 
Um, but you know, we, we could also be some, do something like city contains company or, or something like that. Um, I, I think generally the guideline is if you read it as a sentence, it should make sense, right? So this company has an office in this city. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, and, and, and the other guideline is to be relatively consistent. Um, I think as long as you, you follow those two guidelines, then I, I think you'll be okay, yeah. Yeah, good question. Anyone else? Let's follow up on that, though, but is it, if you wanted to go through and say, well, what companies are in this city, can you not do that with this model, or? So when, when yeah, so, so um, when we write the query, we can, we can write the query uh, using, let's go back to our, our Cypher example. We can write the query to, to traverse either way. Um, and, and actually, we don't even have to specify a direction at query time. Uh, sorry, so the, the question was, if we, if we choose to model a, a relationship direction one way, uh, are we then limited in, in sort of how we can, can query it? Um, and right, so every, every relationship has a direction, and, and we have to store a direction. Uh, but we don't have to specify a direction necessarily when we query it. And a, a good example of where we, we maybe don't care about direction um, is to compare, say, like Facebook friends versus Twitter followers, right? So you can follow someone uh, on Twitter, and, and maybe or maybe not they follow you back. So in that case, you need to model that relationship as directed. And, and if they follow you back, you need to model a second relationship coming the other way. Uh, but on Facebook, when you're become friends, like you both have to accept that. So we don't really care about direction um, with, with that type of relationship. So we might not specify it at query time. We just want to know all the people that are friends. We don't really care who friended whom. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, um, can we have more than one relationship connecting nodes? And, yep, absolutely. Yeah, and, and we can have you know, more than one uh, relationship even of, of the same type between two nodes. Maybe you know, a, a user views a web page and, and that has a timestamp on it, and then I view it again, and, and because I'm storing that timestamp, maybe I want to create another relationship, and that's, that's perfectly valid. Yep. OK, so let's, uh, let's move on to digging into personalized recommendations. Um, so this is, this is something that I think we've all been exposed to. Uh, Netflix and Amazon are, are probably the most talked about in, when you're sort of looking for examples of recommendations. So these are movies and TV shows you may be interested in based on things that you've watched previously. Uh, here are our books or products that you might want to purchase based on your viewing or purchase history or based on what other people that are viewing similar things to you are, are looking at and purchasing. And it, it, it's very obvious that recommendations drive user engagement uh, with, your, with your application, with your service. Um, just grab this quote out of, uh, out of a McKinsey report that said, that 35% of what consumers buy on Amazon and 75% of what people watch on Netflix come from recommendations. So it's certainly something that, um, that increases engagement and, and in some cases, revenue. Um, let's look at sort of a, a hypothetical example um, of the type of data that we're working with and, and maybe some challenges uh, when we're building out a recommendation system. For, for the enterprise. So here's a website. Um, we're shown some personalized promotions. So the Dreamhouse series is 15% off. And then we're presented with specific product recommendations. So people who bought this thing that I'm looking at also bought this other thing. Um, and then similar products in an Office series that I've that I've looked at, right? And and this is dynamic content that's generated based on uh, based on my 
engagement with this website. And if you look at the type of, of algorithms that are used in recommendations, there, there, there's basically two extremes. Uh, so collaborative filtering. Uh, with collaborative filtering, we're looking at data uh, about users and items that they've interacted with. Uh, and, and essentially, it boils down to finding similar users in the network, making the assumption that similar users are interested in similar things, and saying, you know, these things that similar users are interested in, you're probably interested in them too. Um, here's the recommendation. So that's collaborative filtering. Uh, and then content-based recommendations uh, are essentially looking at uh, metadata or in information maybe about a product catalog uh, or, or some sort of concept hierarchy, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, but basically extracting information about the content and using that to generate uh, the recommendation. So if we think of the data model that we would use for these, with collaborative filtering, we're talking about user product interactions, and with content-based, we're looking at sort of extracting information, uh, categorizing products, that type of thing. And I, and I say these are the two extremes um, because in, in reality, like most recommendation systems that are actually implemented out there in the wild are, are some hybrid between the two. And we'll see how we can sort of combine both approaches um, going forward. So if we think about the typical enterprise that, that does maybe um, brick and mortar sales and, and e-commerce as well, we think about sort of these different functions uh, and where the data lives that we need to access to, to generate these type of recommendations. Um, so we need information about purchases that might be stored in, in a relational database like MySQL. We need information about a product catalog. We might be storing that in a, a document store like Mongo. We need information about um, you know, what, what the user has in their shopping cart that might come from you know, Redis or some cache. Uh, so really, you know, we, we have this type of information spread across uh, lots of different database systems in our enterprise. So in order to, to be able to query across these, to piece them together, we need some way to bring this information uh, together. And you might say, oh yeah, I, I've seen that before. That's, that's a data lake, right? So we, we put all of our information into this data lake. Uh, it's great for you know, running MapReduce jobs. Maybe this is on Hadoop or something uh, for you know, sort of analytics and, and BI. And, and that's true, sure. Data lakes are good for that. Um, but the problem is that you know, these are typically things on Hadoop that you know, I can do MapReduce, and that's about it, which means that, um, that sort of the overhead for generating a single recommendation for a single user um, is, is sort of beyond the, the speed that I can have that on the hot path for their recommendations on the store.com, right, on, on my website. So if we, if we look at sort of a, a graph-based approach of this, um, what we often see is that we can bring in information uh, from uh, our relational database that has purchase information, uh, from our, our document store that has product catalog information. We can bring those into a graph database like Neo4j, and then because of this idea of native graph processing, so we, we talked about this idea of index-free adjacency, being able to, to query um, in, in sort of a a constant time performance characteristics across very, very large data sets. Because we have that with graph databases, now the, the query for generating our recommendation uh, can be on the hot path for showing personalized recommendations to our user on the website. And, and why is this important? Well, this means that we can then take into account all the information we have about a user as of that point in time when we're generating the recommendation. If, if we go back to sort of the, the data lake or Hadoop approach, sure, we can generate recommendations you know, across all of the data in our enterprise that we have about a user, 
Uh, but we have to do that you know, nightly or, or hourly. That, that's done in batch. Right? So if I've just bought something or if I've just put something in my shopping cart, I need to take that information into account uh, at the time that I'm generating the recommendation. So that, uh, that, that along with sort of the, the flexibility of the graph model for sort of integrating all these data sets, I, I think is a real advantage, especially when we're talking about uh, building recommender systems. So when we're talking about real time, that this is sort of what we mean, being able to, to have these types of queries on the hot path for personalized recommendations. Cool, so let's look at just sort of some simple examples uh, of how collaborative filtering uh, first, and then we'll talk about uh, content-based recommendations, what simple versions of this look like in a graph. So uh, there's a Will node. Will purchased a book called Data Structures. Uh, Amelia also purchased this book, Data Structures. And then Amelia purchased this other book, Advanced NoSQL. So if we were going to make a very, very simple recommendation, giving only this information that we had, um, we could say, well, Will and Amelia bought the same book. They have some interests in common. Uh, what has Amelia purchased that Will hasn't? Oh, this advanced NoSQL book. This might be a good, a good recommendation for Will. And we can write that in Cypher. Uh, it, it looks like this. So find the Will node, traverse out along this purchase relationship to find books that Will's purchased. Uh, who else has bought the same books as Will? Uh, what other books are those people buying that Will hasn't bought? Recommend those to Will. So that is the sort of simplest form of, of collaborative filtering. Um, there's a lot of problems that we're missing here. There's no sort of uh, scoring or normalizing. Um, we don't really have a measure of how similar to, uh, to my preferences these other users are. Uh, so there's a lot we can do to improve here, but this is, this is sort of a good uh, basic start. Now compare this with a content-based approach. So now Will bought a book, Data Structures, and it has a tag or it's in this category of big data. Uh, what are other books in this category? Oh, here's this advanced NoSQL book. Um, that is a book that's similar in content to a book that Will has purchased. Let's recommend that to him. And we can write that in Cypher. This is almost identical to the previous query, um, except we just changed some of the, the labels and relationship types, but the same, same basic concept. Now, with, with content, we can introduce this idea of a hierarchy. Uh, so we know that big data is maybe a, a sub-tag or a subcategory of data. And another subcategory of data is databases. So we can infer that there's some similarity between the category big data and the category databases. So in my product catalog, I can go up one level. So I don't just have to recommend uh, big data books to Will. But I can also recommend databases book, books because uh, I know that that category is similar to big data because I have some hierarchy uh, that I know um, about my products. And again, we can write this in Cypher. Um, there's just another, another traversal here, but again, very similar to, uh, to what we saw previously. And it's important to point out here that if we don't sort of have this information, if we don't know sort of what the, the hierarchy of, uh, of our book categories are, that's OK, um, because we can use things like um, some natural language processing and, and graph clustering, uh, which we're going to do uh, in a little bit here, to try to infer hierarchies like this uh, based, on, based on sort of just text that we have that describes products. And again, this is just, just a very basic, uh, basic example um, to get started. And we're going to improve this when we actually start working with, uh, with real data. Cool. So I just want to point out a couple of resources. Um, one is Neo4j Sandbox. Uh, so Neo4j Sandbox 
is really cool. It allows you to spin up a Neo4j instance that's personal to you. You can choose from uh, lots of different data sets, and that data is already loaded, and it sort of has queries to sort of guide you through there. This is what we're going to use today. Um, so even if you have Neo4j installed locally, um, we're going to use a custom Neo4j sandbox instance that has the data set that we're going to use and sort of laid out in a, a structured format for going through the exercises. So hopefully everyone's able to use that today. Um, and then I also want, want to point out um, there's an O'Reilly graph databases book um, that talks a lot about the data modeling things that we talked about today, how to build a graph database uh, application. Uh, so after this workshop, if you want uh, to read more about it, that's, that's a great book uh, to get started with. OK, cool. So that's, that's enough of me uh, talking. So let's actually do some hands-on stuff with Neo4j. So a little bit um, of the logistics. So we said that the slides are online, uh, the ones I'm going through now. You can get at bit.ly slash Neo4j OSCON slides, all one word. Um, but for right now, the most important link on here is this first one, which is bit.ly slash Neo4j OSCON. And if you go to this link, what this will do is it will open up a hidden uh, Neo4j sandbox use case that has all the material that we're going to use uh, for the rest of this workshop. So everyone, please right now go to bit.ly slash Neo4j OSCON. Um, and when you do that, you'll see sort of the, the sign-in process for Neo4j Sandbox, right? So you can sign in with Twitter, LinkedIn, Microsoft, GitHub, whatever else is on there. Or, or you can just use, uh, use email to create an account. If you have any issues signing in to that, I, I have all the materials on, on USB keys as well. But it'd be a lot faster and easier if you do that. So if you have any issues um, getting into that, flag me down in a minute, and we'll get that set up for you. And then the other link on here, so, so we said that we're going to use the Python driver for Neo4j and some of the sort of data science uh, tools to do things like um, extract keywords and do some graph clustering, some community detection algorithms. So there is a Jupyter Notebook uh, that we're going to use, and that's at bit.ly slash Neo4j Notebook. Um, but we'll get to that, um, I don't know, maybe in about an hour after, after the break. Cool. So for now, um, just going to walk through what sort of the process for, for getting into the sandbox um, and make sure that we're all um, where we need to be before we move on. Uh, so when you go to this bit.ly link, it uh, will sort of redirect to this page that says get started with graphs, start now, log in. Uh, you can, can log in you know, with Google, LinkedIn, any of these, uh, or just create an account uh, with email. Once you do that, then you'll see a page uh, that has lots of different sandbox instances. Uh, and we're going to use the OSCON 2017 Neo4j workshop uh, use case. So click on Launch Sandbox. And then you'll see some sort of graph trivia while that sandbox is spinning up. Uh, and, and what that's doing, uh, it's provisioning a Neo4j instance in a Docker container on some AWS EC2 con, uh, instance. And it's sort of making that uh, private to you. So once, you, uh, once it spins up, you'll see this, uh, this page that says Get Started, Visit Neo4j Browser with a link. And you click on that, uh, then that will open a new tab with Neo4j Browser and uh, sort of a, a guide for working with Meetup data. So Neo4j Browser is a query workbench for Neo4j. Um, so it, it's developer tooling that we can use to, to write queries and visualize the results. Uh, and it's also very useful for embedding interactive guide content, which is what we're going to use today. 
Um, so on, on this image, there are sort of nine uh, sections. Each one of these uh, we're going to work through today. Probably won't have time to go through all of them. Um, hopefully, we can get through at least the first four um, in the next hour or so. Uh, and then you know, you'll have these when you go home. Feel free to, to work through them. So the goal uh, for right now is that everyone uh, should be on a screen that looks like this with that, that Meetup logo and this thing that says our schedule for the day. Uh, so please, if you want to follow along, please go ahead and do that right now because that's, that's sort of where we need to be uh, in order to, to move on. So let me just go ahead and, and do that. So I'm going to go to bit.ly slash Neo4j OSCON. And let me, I already had one spun up here, so let me log out and sign in again. This is OK. You can sign in with Twitter. Great. And now I'm presented with a bunch of different use cases. And I'm going to choose the OSCON Neo4j workshop use case. So I click on this, and it's spinning up a new Neo4j instance for me on AWS. And once it's ready, it's going to give me uh, sort of my credentials for accessing Neo4j browser, uh, which is right here. So I'm going to click on Visit Neo4j Browser. And I get this screen uh, in Neo4j Browser. So note, though, um, just give a, a quick overview of, of Neo4j Browser. So Neo4j Browser is, is a, a web application. Um, in, in this case, it's connected to my Neo4j instance running on, uh, on AWS. But I could also uh, have it running on, on localhost. Um, basically, I write Cypher queries up here. So match on all nodes and then return uh, the count. So how many nodes do I have in Neo4j? I have zero. If I had anything, I would have uh, some sort of graph visualization. I can also click on this database drawer uh, to, to sort of inspect the, the node labels and relationship types that I have, but I, I don't have any data right now. Uh, one, another interesting thing I can do is I can save queries. So let's say I was so impressed by this you know, match on everything and, and tell me how many nodes I have. Uh, I was so impressed by this query that I wanted to, uh, to save it into my favorites. I could click on this, uh, this star, this sort of favorite icon, uh, and note here that I, I put a comment uh, as the first line. Uh, so if I hit the star, now in my favorites drawer, which is this one right here, uh, even after I, I clear out the query, now I have this super awesome query that I can uh, refer to later. So that, that's useful if, if you're sort of working through uh, a more complex query. You want to save it later, come back to it. Um, OK, and then what we're going to do is we're going to work through each one of these browser guides. So you can see this guide loads automatically. Uh, it's kind of like a carousel. There are multiple panes to it. So I can click the, the left and the right arrow. Uh, and then each one of these is uh, sort of the index for another sort of chapter. So we're going to start at, at uh, the first one, which is recommend groups by topic, uh, where we're going to talk about how we would model uh, and import this meetup data. But before we go on, I want to make sure that everyone um, is at this space um, right now, looking at sort of this, this meetup um, screen. So we'll take just a couple minutes to make sure everyone, um, everyone's there. If not, uh, raise your hand, and, and we'll try to get that set up for you.